To my surprise, there was no wedding here in our church on February 2 of this year, or 2-2-22. There was also no wedding on 2-22-22, maybe because of the Omicron variant COVID surge. In fact, checking my records a few years back, there was no wedding on 1-11-11, perhaps because it was a Tuesday, or even on 11-11-11 because it was a Friday. Not only are these dates easy to remember, they are recognized as so-called auspicious or lucky days by many Asians because of the repeated numbers. Hopefully, it indicates that in our community, we don't buy into this type of numerology. But being primarily Asian, we all love numbers, especially dates. Unfortunately, I'm terrible at remembering dates. My son Nathan was born on November 10 or 11:10 at around 8 p.m. I remember around 7 p.m., as Cindy was in heavy labor, I asked her, Honey, can you wait until midnight to give birth? She asked why. I said, Because if you wait until midnight, then Nathan will be born on 1111, and it's way easier for me to remember than 1110. She then gave me a look that said, You better stop talking or I'm going to punch you. Unfortunately, many Asians look at numbers as more than just numbers or dates but sadly associate good fortunes or luck with them. Numerology, especially in the Asian cultures, is prevalent in our world today. As we get closer to the coming of our Lord and in these end times, we're told in the Bible that the world will get darker and more sinful. People will more easily fall into the illusions of superstitions, especially numerology or feng shui, to somehow provide greater blessing or more luck. For those of you who may not know, in the Chinese culture, there are lucky numbers and there are unlucky numbers, and it's more than simple superstition. Many aspects of daily life in China and in Chinese communities all around the world are based on these numbers. Everyone carefully selects numbers so that it contains these lucky numbers. Now, what makes the number so lucky? Partly, it's based on the sound of the number. For example, when you say certain numbers, the sound is similar to positive words in the Chinese language like fortune, wealth, prosperity, and so on. The luckiest number of all is eight. Why? Because when you say the word eight, ba in Chinese, it sounds like the Chinese word for prosperity. On the other hand, the number four, si, is a terribly unlucky number in the Chinese culture. When you say the word four in Chinese, it sounds like you're saying the word death. And so Western tourists are often assigned on the fourth floor at hotels in China and in Taiwan. And in many cases, the floor numbering in a building elevator goes from three directly to five. Some skyscrapers even skip all the 40s. You go from the 39th floor directly to the 50th floor. So what are the other so-called lucky numbers? Well, 518. It sounds like I want prosperity or I will prosper in Chinese digitalk. You can add a nine at the end. 5189, that means I want prosperity for a long time. Or 5918, I will soon prosper. The number 666 is not considered a bad number in the Chinese culture. In fact, it's considered a very lucky number. Its connotation is an easy, smooth life. 168 is a lucky number, sounding like one road to prosperity, and is a very common number to see incorporated into a business name. 58 or 58 means I am prosperous. That's also a good number. Now for some unlucky numbers, here are a few. 74, 74 is not a great sounding number because 7 sounds like angry and 4 sounds like death. So 74 is angry death and should be avoided at all cost. 514 sounds like I want to die. It must be tough to be a Chinese immigrant living in Montreal, Canada, where the area code is 514, especially when just across the U.S. border are all those lucky citizens of Chautauqua, New York. They are blessed with an area code of 518, again sounding like I will prosper. So you have I want to die, and across the border, I will prosper. The opening ceremony of the Summer Olympics in Beijing in 2008 began on 8.8.08 at 8 seconds and 8 minutes past 8 p.m. local time. 
The Petronas Twin Towers in Malaysia each have 88 floors. The KLM flight from Hong Kong to Amsterdam is flight KL-888. And the United Airlines route from San Francisco to Beijing is flight 888. But numerology isn't limited to the Asian Chinese culture. It is prevalent in the Western culture as well, even in the U.S. Researchers estimate that as many as 10% of the U.S. population has a fear of the number 13, and even more the specific fear of Friday the 13th, resulting in financial losses in excess of $1 billion annually as people avoid marrying, traveling, and in the most severe cases, even working on Friday the 13th. According to the Stress Management Center and Phobia Institute in Asheville, North Carolina, more than 80% of high-rise buildings in the U.S. do not have a 13th floor, and the vast majority of hotels, hospitals, and airports avoid using the number 13 for rooms and gates as well. The Las Vegas airport does not have a gate 13 in any of its concourses. Since it's a city known for gambling, it's not surprising it would avoid unlucky numbers. Now you may be chuckling at the silliness of it all, but these are the beliefs of very smart, logical, and educated people. Many of them would not believe in the one true God, but would have no problems believing the power of numbers the power of how energy flows through your house based on how you arrange your home furnishing, and the power of a waving golden cat. Indeed, as 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 tells us, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The world is blinded. While some may find it harmless and even laughable, Superstitious beliefs are often dangerous and affects our outlook on life, preventing us from depending on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's address this issue of superstition and superstitious beliefs as we continue our sermon series titled Marvel. In this series, we're looking at the seven miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John and seeing how God uniquely displays His omnipotent power and how we are to respond to God's power. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, as we take a look at verses 1 to 15. John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. I read now verses 1 to 4. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. The Bible tells us that in the northern part of the city of Jerusalem was a pool where many of the sick of the city hung out because of its supposed healing power. The mass of people gathered around this massive pool with its five porches, as described in verse 3, was a sad picture of the plight of many of the city's people. There were many who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed. While it was depressing because they were sick and infirmed, what is sadder was because these people were holding on to a hope and belief that was utterly hopeless and ineffective. Apparently, there was a legend that the people believed in, that an angel would come unexpectedly and stir the waters. And according to the local tradition, the first one in the water would be healed. Of course, nowhere in the Bible does it teach this kind of healing practice. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that angels have this power. This was a superstitious belief that held no truth, but in fact was the most cruel contest for the many sick people in Jerusalem. The people would waste their time as they waited and waited. They would wait for days, months, and even years just to be the first person to jump into the water when they saw a water ripple. Just think how hopeless this situation was because anything can cause the water ripple, a wind gust, a pebble or rock that fell in, even a falling leaf. They would see the ripple in the water And everyone would jump into the water just to have the chance to be the first person in and possibly be healed. 
let's say 100 people jumped into the water, but none were healed, what would they think? They would not think that this superstition was stupid and useless. They would think that they were simply not the first ones in because of how big the pool system was. And I visited this excavated site in Jerusalem, and it's a huge system of pools. No one would ever know if someone else got healed. They just simply assumed they were not the first ones in and someone else got healed. Or perhaps they would think it was not an angel that caused that ripple in the water. And so their attempts to jump in was a futile effort. And no wonder no one got healed. Something else caused that ripple. But they would be soaking wet as they got out of that Bethesda pool and they would dry off only to do it again and jump right back in and then dry off, perhaps multiple times a day. What a sad situation. But that is what hope does when you are desperate. You will do whatever it takes because you see a glimmer of hope that you can be saved from your most desperate situation. Also, did you notice that the Bible tells us that there were paralytics gathered around this massive pool? What in the world were they doing there? There was no chance they would be the first ones in because they could not move. They would need a companion with them to push them into the pool and then for that companion to swim into the pool to drag them back out to try again. I'm not sure there would be many who would be that patient to wait around all day to push a paralytic into the water and then pull them back out again, getting wet multiple times a day. But yet there were many paralytics around the pool, the Bible says, just to have the impossible chance to be the first ones in. A truly pathetic picture of false hope in an utterly hopeless situation. And yet because people are looking for hope today, any hope, they will often turn to superstition and legends. They're willing to try anything for a glimmer of hope. Everyone is looking for hope. That's why studies have shown that sugar pills, also known as placebos, can alleviate many symptoms of someone sick if the sick person believes he's getting treatment. Current research reveals that one in three people find such medication to be helpful even when they're told they're getting a placebo. People's strong belief in something that does not have any effect may be temporarily effective psychologically but does not provide permanent effectiveness or cure, and therefore still hopeless. This should be no surprise to us, because Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 22 says that people who refuse to honor God descend into futile thinking, and although they think they are smart, they become fools. As someone once said, the first effect of not believing in God is to believe in anything. The first effect of not believing in God is to believe in anything. There is true hope in the person of Jesus Christ, God Himself. But because He's been rejected by the world, the world turns to other things. My friends, listen carefully. A belief not based on truth is hopeless. Adhering to it is not only a waste of time and futile, it is dangerous because it provides false hope whether it be superstition, old wives' tales, and any other beliefs not based on truth. And that's our first biblical principle, biblical principle number one. A belief not based on truth, like superstition, is hopeless. A belief not based on truth, like superstition, is hopeless. What superstitious practices do you believe in? Unless it is based on truth, it is utterly hopeless and therefore a waste of time for you to do. It's also a waste of emotion and resources. But not only is superstitious practices hopeless and a waste of time, there's something even more sinister that it does. Look with me at verses 5 to 7. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. The Bible tells us that there was a man who was infirm for 38 years. Now, we don't know if it was from birth, acquired, or developed. 
And we don't know the extent of his physical problem other than he was unable to walk. Most likely, he was a paralytic. It was a hopeless condition for him. But yet there he was by the pool of Bethesda, hoping against hope to be healed of his condition that he has suffered for 38 years. You can just imagine the years of agonizing weight by that pool. And yet he never gave up hope that this superstitious legend about an angel moving the waters would one day cure him. Perhaps he had been at that pool for 38 years. Imagine that. Even if it had not cured him in those 38 years, his life was so controlled by his false belief that it could. Would you wait around for something for 38 years for something to happen? I certainly wouldn't. But this man was so steep in his belief that he was there. The man admitted to Jesus that he had no companion to push him into the pool at the first sign of the stirring of the waters. And there would be always someone else who would jump in before him when he was able to make it into the water. So he assumed that's why he never got healed. So Jesus asked the man a strange question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? The answer is yes, of course. That's why he was at the pool of Bethesda. But I believe that Jesus asked this question because it was designed to have the man redirect his focus away from the inability of the pool to heal and save him to Jesus who could. It was almost rhetorical in nature. Do you want to be healed? Implied in Jesus' question is the challenge. If yes, then why are you at this pool which can't heal you? Why are you still hanging around when it hasn't healed you in 38 years? In essence, Jesus was asking this man where he wanted to place his trust. In the legend of the pool where even the man admitted he would never be the first one in, or in the only true solution to his problem, which was in the person of Jesus, who as God himself had the power to heal him. The man's answer in verse 7 shows you how trapped he was in his superstitious beliefs. He did have a desire to be healed, but he believed that the only way for him to be healed would be for him to be the first one into the pool when the waters stirred. His answer seems to imply that he wants the Lord's help to push him into the water first the next time it moved. That's all he wanted Jesus to do, to push him in. He didn't realize that he was talking to the Son of God, God himself, who could heal him with just a word. It shows you how much that superstition had taken control of his life, that he saw no other options in how to be healed. In the same way, we may not realize it, but superstitious practices often have such control of our lives that it changes the way we live. That's why a few years ago, when the church offered free weddings during the so-called ghost months sometime between August and September, no one took the offer. When we say we don't believe in numerology or other superstitious practices, but then say it doesn't hurt if we follow some of it just to be on the safe side then we are already being controlled by it. If, for example, we don't hold an event because a certain day is supposedly unlucky, or we choose not to live on the fourth floor simply because it is the fourth floor, or use the numbers 13 or 666 just to avoid any possible bad luck, then it has already affected us. That's why I encourage people not to read their daily horoscopes. Because while we know it is not true, When we know what will supposedly happen to us today, it makes us more suspicious, cautious, and knowing what the horoscope says will linger in the back of our minds and affect us. For example, if my horoscope says that today is going to be a very bad day, even if I don't really believe it, then if something unfortunate does happen to you, like let's say you were on your way to work and you were on your phone and you tripped and fell and your phone broke, then you may begin to think that somehow the horoscope came true and you blame your fall on your bad luck. But if you had not read your daily horoscope and the same unfortunate thing happened and you were looking at your phone when you tripped as you were walking and your phone broke, then you would have blamed your own carelessness. My friends, we're all looking for something to blame for our misfortune and something to credit our blessings. And following a set of rules to ensure blessings and avoid misfortunes is what we like. 
But the sad reality is not only does life not work like this, we will then be controlled by these false beliefs just like this man. For example, in our culture, friends and family members whose zodiac sign is opposite of the loved one who died are not allowed to enter the wake and grieve and mourn because there's supposedly a clash of energy, a chong. Another example, Cindy and I got married on June the 7th, which was supposedly a so-called bad day for us to hold a celebratory event. I remember a person who told us not to get married on that day. But of course, we're Christians and we didn't believe this. And we got married on June the 7th and nothing happened to us. In fact, it was one of the most special and most beautiful days in my life. I remember what Psalm 118 verse 24 tells us. Psalm 118 verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. My friends, every day we have the breath of life is a good day because it is another day God has given us to live for Him. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. There are no good days, bad days. Every day is a good day given by God. While assumptions can be wrong and having the wrong facts can be embarrassing, at a higher level, Superstitious practices are more dangerous because oftentimes it controls our lives, so much so that we can't live for God. And putting it all together, we have our second biblical principle, biblical principle number two. Superstitious practices control our lives, taking our focus away from God. Superstitious practices control our lives, taking our focus away from God. Knowing that superstitious practices can control our lives, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, these words. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. This verse tells us superstitions, legends, false beliefs, old wives' tales have no place in the Christian life because it is opposite of godliness and can take control of our lives. My friends, don't let superstitions and old wives' tales control your life because it will quickly do so, and it is a ploy of the evil one to take your focus away from God. Christians aren't immune from superstition working its way into Christian disciplines and practices. For example, influenced by the pagan art of fortune-telling, Christians living in the 4th and 5th centuries began the practice of turning to the Bible for magical direction concerning any matter about which they might be concerned. They would lay down a Bible in a church, upon an altar, or especially upon the grave of a saint. Then they sought for the answer in the first passage which met their eye upon opening the Bible randomly. I wonder if any of us have done something similar. A modern example of this would be, let's say, since my birthday is January 21, I will look at all of the verses of chapter 2, verse 1, in the 66 books of the Bible for my guidance for the day, like a biblical horoscope. So Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, Joshua 2, verse 1, my horoscope for the day. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So I read this verse and I say, okay, there's a harlot, a prostitute mentioned. I guess it's okay to have another woman, another wife. Thanks, God. Or Ruth chapter 2 verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So I read this verse and I say, ah, I guess I need to find a rich man. Or 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Then the days of David drew near that he should die. And I think to myself, oh no, I'm going to die. Or 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1, because that spells 21. These were the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun. I guess I'm going to have six boys, or I guess I'm going to have six children. Or 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1. Then Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal house for himself. I guess God wants me to purchase that house. I hope you can see my point of how ridiculous this is 
of using the Bible as some sort of spiritual horoscope, and yet many do it. They will make the Bible say what it does not say. They will say, Lord, speak to me today. Whatever verse I turn to and point to with my fingers, with my eyes closed, will be your word for me. Sound familiar? Have you ever done this? This practice actually has a name. It's called Sortis Sanctorum. The Council of Vienna passed an ordinance against such practices in 465. And the Council of Agde in 508 banned such practices. God's guidance does not follow the pattern of divination and necromancy. That's not how the Bible is to be used. Christians, as an example to this world, should not follow superstitions because in our examples, we must show that we do not place our hope in what is hopeless and untrue. Our hope is placed in the person of the triune God and in the truths of His holy revealed words. We should not let our culture drive us. We are Christians first, and then our ethnicity and its practices second, and only if it doesn't conflict with the Scriptures. Look with me now at verses 8 and 9 of John chapter 5. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The man without hope for 38 years, who had been waiting hopelessly by the pool of Bethesda because of a belief in a superstitious legend, was immediately healed when Christ commanded him to rise, take up your bed and walk. This man showed faith in the person and words of Jesus, leaving behind his faith in the legend of the pool when he took up his bed, stood up, and began to walk. If you don't use muscles for 38 years, Doctors will tell you that there would be such severe muscle atrophy or muscle loss that it would prevent you from walking immediately. But the fact that this man was able to walk immediately means that part of the miracle was that all of his muscles needed for walking was restored. It is evidently clear that only Jesus provides real hope, true healing, and real salvation. And this is our third biblical principle, biblical principle number three. Only in Jesus Christ is there real hope for this world. Only in Jesus Christ is there real hope for this world. Our Lord is the only real hope, for He alone is able to heal both physically and spiritually. He heals both physical and spiritual hurts. When we put our hope in the Savior, then our hope is no longer hopeless but our hope is assured. I was reading an article by Katrina Escalona about nine superstitions many Filipinos still believe, and I wasn't aware of many of them. But let me share some with you. Number one, the number of steps of staircases at home should not be divisible by three. Enter a Filipino household with a staircase and begin chanting oro, gold, plata, silver, mata, death taking one step up with each word. Most likely upon reaching the top step, the chant will end with either oro or plata. This is because many Filipinos will go to great lengths to avoid ending in mata, which denotes bad luck. The two preceding words, on the other hand, obviously denote good fortunes. So imagine that the number of steps in your home staircase, if you have one, has a bearing on your life. The second superstition Turn your plate when someone leaves in the middle of a meal. When sitting at the dining table for a meal and someone gets up to leave before the rest of the group finishes, everybody left at the table should turn their plates to ensure safe travels for the person leaving. Another meal superstition, although more loosely believed, is that the table should not start being cleared while people are still eating. If this is done, it is believed that the last person dining will live a lonely life. So maybe that's why you have such a lonely life, because you eat too slow. The third superstition is this. Don't go straight home after attending a wake. This superstition is called pagpag, the shaking off of dirt. In the context of a wake, it means going elsewhere after attending the wake before heading home to shake off the spirit of the deceased, lest it follows you home. Superstitions surrounding wakes are among the most widely practiced by Filipinos still today. 
Another is that the family of the deceased should not drop off visitors at the door upon saying goodbye, as it symbolizes dropping them off at their own deaths. And as for serving food at wakes, be it heavy meals or light snacks, at Filipino wakes, it is customary to provide for food. Visitors should not make the mistake of taking any home with them, be it a small piece of candy, as it signifies inviting misfortune into your home. If this is all true, you and I might as well not go to any wakes because it's simply too risky and too dangerous with all the bad things that can supposedly happen. The fourth superstition is this. Reassure your host that you're human. A very common line used by Filipinos when knocking on someone's door is, Tao po, are you a person? Many assume it refers to the knocker calling out to ask if there are any people inside, when actually it is said to stem from the knocker reassuring the people inside that he or she is a person and not a possibly harmful supernatural creature. The fifth Filipino superstition, siblings should not marry within the same year. This superstition is called sukob and advises against siblings marrying within the same year as it is said to divide the lot between the two marriages. Another type of sukob advises against marriages within the same year as the death of an immediate family member. Pushing to do so is considered bad luck. Another wedding-related superstition is that the bride should never try on her dress before the big day. This is said to bring bad luck and cause the cancellation of the union. A sixth superstition, to serve pancit or noodles at celebrations, especially birthdays. This ever-present dish at Filipino gatherings is believed to represent long life. And while Filipinos today may joke and even laugh about actually believing that this noodle dish is served for long life, it remains a staple at nearly every birthday feast. The seventh superstition is this, respect the elementals. Filipino folklore is rich with a variety of elementals, from giants smoking tobacco to small grumpy old men living in anthills. Stories of these creatures fill the childhoods of many Filipino children, inciting both intrigue and fear. Many superstitions still surround the beliefs in such creatures today. Among the most practiced is the saying of tabi tabi po, excuse me, when passing through places where elementals are likely to dwell. These places are usually outdoors, such as anthills and balete trees. Failure to do so and disturbing such creatures may lead to unexplained sicknesses that can only be cured by an albulario, a folk healer. The eighth superstition is this. Be careful when showing fondness over babies. It's difficult to restrain from playing with cute babies or complimenting their parents on their adorable features. But doing so in the Philippines is believed by some to be a potential cause of illness. Referred to as either usog or bati. This superstition says that when a person with strong energy greets a child, the child may soon after suffer from unexplainable discomfort. That's why, especially in the countryside, older people know to say, Puera usog, when showing fondness over children. This is meant to counter any usog that may have happened otherwise. If this isn't said, and parents attribute certain maladies of their children to usog, they may ask the greeter to smear the saliva on the suffering child's forehead as a cure. This is just weird to me, especially the part about smearing saliva on a child. Now, the ninth superstition is this. Blame your missing things on elves. In the Philippines, there is an assumption that when items around the house go missing and reappear, this is caused by duende, or playful elves. While mischievous, these little creatures are believed to be mostly harmless aside from the type that takes small children. Now, the reason I just took time and shared these Filipino superstitions is not only to show how ridiculous some of these practices are, but for many of us, we simply follow through in these cultural practices without knowing the reasons or the background of why we do it. And it is important that in whatever culture, we need to understand and know why we do what we do. You see, if Jesus Christ is the only real hope for this world, then as followers of Christ, we should not practice even cultural things that are steeped in superstitious beliefs because it may confuse the world we are trying to serve as a witness to about where we find our hope 
and security in this life. Look at me in verses 10 to 15. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. When the Jewish religious leaders asked the man who had healed him, he didn't know Jesus' name because there were so many people by the pool of Bethesda. Later, Jesus looked for him and found the healed man in the temple area and reminded him that even though he had been healed physically, there was something more important that he needed to care about, which was his own spiritual healing. Jesus' warning, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you, does not mean that his inability to walk was caused by any specific sin, although all disease and death comes ultimately from sin and the fallen world in which we live. The warning was that his tragic life of 38 years as a paralytic was no comparison to the tragedy of a life in hell. Jesus was interested not merely in the healing of a person's body. Far more important to Jesus was the healing of his soul from sin. You see, my friends, the true hope and healing that comes from our Lord is in his ability to save us from our sins, to give us eternal life when we deserve death and hell. You see, sometimes God in His divine wisdom and sovereignty does not heal us from our physical sicknesses for His greater glory. But God always heals us spiritually when we call upon His name and believe in Him. And this spiritual healing through salvation free is so much better than a temporary physical healing of a corruptible body living in this fleeting world. And putting it all together, we have our fourth biblical principle, Biblical principle number four, the true hope and healing that Jesus provides is victory over sin. The true hope and healing that Jesus provides is victory over sin. Christ dealt with the problem which superstitious practices cannot solve, which is our sin problem. And only the true Savior and the person of Jesus Christ can provide salvation when He died on the cross for our sins and through His shed blood cleanses us from our sins. His forgiveness of our sins means we have victory over sin, and that's where true hope and true healing is found, when we can claim victory over sin. It is not in the wearing of a cross that we are saved. It is not in having a picture of Jesus in our homes that saves us. It is not in saying the Lord's Prayer or memorizing Psalm 23 that saves us. It is placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that saves us. And it is in the person of Christ that we find true hope and healing. If our hope lies in the person of Christ, then we can get rid of any superstitious practices in our lives and can choose not to live bound by superstition. Now, some of you may be afraid to let go of your lucky charms or your superstitious beliefs and practices because you think something will go wrong or something bad will happen to you if you choose to let go of those things. And I'm sure if you choose to cut away from these sinful practices, the evil one will make it hard for you to let go of these things. And you can even expect some unfortunate things to happen simply to get you to return to these superstitious practices. However, my friends, let me encourage you to pray often and ask help from the God who is more powerful than Satan to cut away from these sinful and useless practices and beliefs. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 reminds us that greater is He that is in us, God Himself, than he that is of the world, Satan. So don't be afraid to stop any superstitious practices because, number one, a belief not based on truth like superstition is hopeless. Number two, Superstitious practices control our lives, taking our focus away from God. Number three, only in Jesus Christ is there real hope for this world. Number four, the true hope and healing that Jesus provides is victory over sin. My friends, examine your life. 
If there is anything that is inconsistent with what the Bible teaches, may you get rid of it in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this wake-up call for all of us to examine our lives, to see that the practices we do are consistent with the Scriptures. And Lord, if there's anything that we hold on to, anything that we do that we're unfamiliar with, or why we do what we do, or perhaps it is in conflict with the Scriptures, but yet it is part of our culture, give us the confidence, the patience, the wisdom, and the boldness to cut away from doing those things. Father, we want to live as godly Christians, faithful followers of Jesus Christ to serve as a testimony to this world. Give us the strength to do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.